Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for attending this deep dive on, what I can't think of a more pressing issue of the day, which is the threats that we face when it comes to cybersecurity and the values questions uh, that they pose in terms of how to combat it. Before we get started, just the usual reminder of please turn off your cell phones. We're going to move through this uh, deep dive, and I'm going to cycle through it and introduce the speakers as we go through each panel. And the total uh, session will be about 90 minutes. But I thought I'd start a little bit with a question that confronted me when I was at uh, the Justice Department heading the National Security Division. And at that point, we had the task of protecting the country against all national security threats, but particularly on our mind was terrorism. The National Security Division was created as a post-9-11 reform. And it said, essentially, that one of the reasons we'd lost so many lives on September 11th was that we had failed to share information adequately across the law enforcement and intelligence divide. That was a mistake that was preventable, and they couldn't be made again. And so the division was created, the Justice Department, to combine the expertise of prosecutors on the one hand, those that understood the criminal justice system, and the intelligence lawyers and specialists, on the other hand, to make sure that information was shared within and between governments. Let me take you for a second to a real case. So imagine you're back in your normal lives. Let's say you're a CEO, because this is the Aspen Institute. So uh, uh, you're a CEO of a company, and you get a knock on the door. And the person at the other end of the door says, hey, boss, we got a problem. Someone has broken into our system and they've stolen a relatively small amount of personal identifiable information. But don't worry, it was really unsophisticated. We messed up on how we configured one of our servers. We know how they, they got in and we got them out. So they go away. You don't think about it. A couple weeks later, knock on the door again. Uh, boss, got an update. We realize we got an email. It's poorly spelled and it has some grammatical errors. But it says basically, hey, I'm kind of ticked that you threw me off of your system, and I want you to let me back on to the system. If you don't, I'm going to release the information I took from the company and embarrass you. Oh, and I want 500 bucks through Bitcoin. So they present that to the CEO. Thousands and thousands of companies are facing this exact situation every day. There's an estimate that around 40% of companies have been hit with some form of either ransomware or extortion, cyber-enabled extortion. With this particular version, the internal team is usually would say, hey, we're not that worried about this because got a lot of chutzpah, but the guy is actually asking to get back in on the system, so we probably did a pretty good job of kicking them off of the system. Also, it's a relatively small amount. Sometimes they ask for millions of dollars. This is just 500 bucks through Bitcoin. Many companies today faced with that situation are paying the 500 bucks through Bitcoin or are deciding, who cares? If this gets released, it's not that embarrassing. This, however, is a real case and explains what we're doing here today and why this is a pressing national security problem. In this case, the company didn't just handle it with themselves. They engaged the public sector. There was conversation between the two. And because of that, what they found out was this wasn't the low-level hacker that it looked like. Don't get me wrong, he really did want the 500 bucks. But as it turned out, this was an individual named Farizi. Farizi was an extremist from Kosovo who had moved from Kosovo to Malaysia in part to get access to greater bandwidth to do this type of attack. From Malaysia, he worked with a, a fellow co-conspirator and extremist in Kosovo, and the two of them had hacked into this trusted US company with a brand name that you would all recognize. And they took this personal identifiable information, this customer information, names, and addresses. And they wanted the 500 bucks. But on the other end of it, Farizi, and this is where social media comes into play. At the time, at the Justice Department, my last two years, 2014 to 2016, roughly, we brought more international terrorism cases than we'd ever brought before in the department. And why? It was because we saw the Islamic State of the Levant adapt a new strategy. If you think of Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda plotted and planned in a carefully controlled way. They took operatives from inside the United States. They brought them over geographically to the Afghanistan-Pakistan region. 
They trained them in person. They had very good operational security. And then they deployed them with the goal of committing an attack uh, on a scale as spectacular as that of September 11th. We got very good post 9-11 with the reforms that I was talking about at sharing information to disrupt that sort of attack. And there hasn't been an attack, uh, not that they haven't tried, of the scale of September 11th since. But the Islamic State and the Levant switched strategies. They decided, just like Al Qaeda used aviation, a Western created tool that does much good and fuels global commerce, and turned it against us to create weapons out of airplanes, they started using social media. And the Islamic State and Levant figured we can essentially crowdsource terrorism. What we can do is using the low barrier to access, we can target the young, those who feel disaffected, and bombard them day after day with slickly produced propaganda that looks as good as commercial grade product to try to convince them to come to our cause. And it was working. Inside the United States, we didn't have a specific geographic region that caused uh, the issue. There was no one place in the country that was particularly disaffected. There wasn't even one group. What we saw instead were cases open in all 50 states. And in terms of the cases that we brought, we brought cases in over 30 different states, criminal cases in over 30 different states. The common factor with the people uh, who wanted to commit these terrorist acts was age in part. Over half of the cases that we brought, the defendants were 25 or younger. And in one third, the defendants were 21 or younger. One third. That has never been the face of an international terrorist before in the United States. And success is not prosecuting kids. It may be necessary as a tactic to prevent these terrorist attacks, but success is figuring out a way to keep terrorists from overseas from reaching young people inside the United States and convincing them to turn themselves into human weapons. I give you this background because at the tip of the spear of that propaganda effort was a man named Junaid Hussein. Junaid Hussein was a British, uh, was a citizen who lived in England near London. And it was a computer hacker who, after getting out of jail for computer hacking, had become more and more extremist. He had moved from England to Raqqa, Syria, where he was located at the very heart of the Islamic State of the Levant, a group uh, at the time who murdered, as a regular tactic, believers and non-believers alike, that believed slavery was an appropriate tool and enslaved people into their organization, and that raped for political purposes. So this group that was committed to murder, slavery, and rape has Junaid Hussein at the tip of the spear of trying to convince people to join them in Raqqa, Syria, and he's talking directly to people inside the United States along with other English speakers. He becomes friends with Farizi, our extremist from Kosovo who's moved to Malaysia and hacked into this trusted US company and stolen US customer information. And how do they become friends? We have Facebook here today to hear from, but it wasn't Facebook, it was Twitter. So. You're safe. But they become friends solely through Twitter. And they start exchanging messages through Twitter. And Junaid Hussein convinces Farizi to provide him the information that he stole from this US company. Junaid Hussein could care less about the 500 bucks through Bitcoin. Junaid Hussein, consistent with the Islamic State and Levant's mission, wants to use that information to kill. So what he does is he calls through that list to look for who might be a US government employee, who might be a police officer. He uses that list of stolen information. And then again, using Twitter, he blasts that information out through social media, trying to reach young people in the United States and saying, kill these people by name, by address, using the information entrusted to the US company for their care. What looked like a relatively small hacking incident. This threat, which I call sometimes the blended threat, is the new face of national security threats, where it's becoming increasingly hard to tell when a threat blends whether it's criminal or whether it's going to turn from criminal to nation state or from criminal to terrorist. And the tools that they're using to commit these types of attacks are for sale on the dark web and more and more easily accessible, including the most sophisticated nation state tools are more and more ending up in the hands of organized criminal groups. And it's a matter of time when it comes to the terrorist groups. They've already announced their intent, just like before 9-11. Zawahiri said way back in 2012 that he called for cyber jihad. He said he wants to destroy the financial uh, underpinnings of the West through cyber attack. It's a matter of time before their intent catches up with their capability. And we need to use that time to figure out how do we harden our systems? How do we prevent that type of attack from occurring. In this case, because of the partnership between this private company and government, effective action was able to be taken. 
One of the reasons I can go into so many details in this case is because pursuant to US process, Farizi was arrested in Malaysia, extradited to the United States, and sentenced two summers ago to 20 years in prison in the Eastern District of Virginia. Junaid Hussein, who is outside the scope and reach of US law enforcement and process, was killed in an openly acknowledged military strike by Central Command. Think of the complexity of the problem, though. It's six different countries. It's moving at the speed of cyber. It's requiring tools, legal tools, that range from diplomatic to criminal to the use of military force in order to combat. And, and this will be the thing we focus on most today, when you think of all the institutional reforms we made after September 11th, the billions of dollars that were spent, the new departments and divisions like National Security Division, Director of National Intelligence, Homeland Security, that was all about the problem set of how do we share information at speed within and between governments. Our next challenge, though, right, is different. How do we share information with the private sector at the speed and scales with which government create, uh, collects that information when our, all of our systems are designed to be kept within government and secret and classified? And how do we figure out ways to incentivize or get information back from companies consistent with civil rights, civil liberties, with the different values of the countries in which they operate, that's also going to happen at the speed and scale that's necessary to combat that threat. I'll stop with just, uh, close with just a couple more cases. But trying out this new approach of sharing information just like we did on terrorism with law enforcement and intelligence, for the first time we started making steps that led to the first case of its kind in 2014, which was the indictment of five P uh, members of the People's Liberation Army, Unit 61398, for the actions they took targeting private companies like Westinghouse, who was about to do a joint venture with a Chinese partner, and the day before they were going to do the venture, the Chinese company went in, the Chinese, sorry, military went in, stole the technical design specifications for a lead pipe that they otherwise were going to lease, and then no longer needed to pay for it. Or as was uh, outlined in that same case, you saw a US subsidiary of a German multinational company that produced solar power. These same uniformed members of the People's Liberation Army went in, stole the pricing information for that solar company, used that information to price dump, forced that company into bankruptcy, and then to add insult to injury, when that company sued for unfair trade practices, they stole the whole litigation strategy. So that's what we were seeing from China. And we put it as an exhibit in that case, just to give you an idea. This activity started around 9 in the morning, Beijing time. It went from 9 to noon. Unlike uh, the working lunches that you do here at the Aspen Ideas Festival, apparently they took a break because it decreased from 12 to 1 Beijing time. It then started up again from roughly 1 to 6 o'clock and decreased on weekends and Chinese holidays. Now, the former prosecutor in me would call that circumstantial evidence as to who did it. But it also makes a bigger point, right? The second largest military in the world at the time, the People's Liberation Army, their day job, every time they put that uniform on, went up and went to work, was targeting private companies for the economic gain of those private companies' competitors. If you ask a private company, deal with that on your own, they can't. It's fundamentally got to be a government problem, too, when it comes to deterring the behavior of China at targeting these private companies. Bringing this prosecution was a start in that direction. It was very controversial at the time because it was the use of the criminal justice tool against uniformed members of another uh, nation's military. And we explained at the time, there's a concept many of you uh, know from day-to-day -day life or non-lawyers of the easement. This is the idea under common law that if you let someone walk across your lawn long enough, they get the legal right under customary law to walk across your lawn. And that's why we put up no trespass signs. So in some ways, this was the beginning of a strategy of putting up no trespass signs, get off our lawn. It's not acceptable to use a military or intelligence to target private companies for the benefit of their economic competitors. And if that sounds like a somewhat narrow principle, that's because it is. It did lead to, it lead to a breakthrough between President Obama and President Xi, where they agreed as a principle, as a norm in this space, and if you think of it in some ways as the Wild West, the beginning of bringing law to the Wild West is to agree on what the laws should be, they agreed that that should be a norm going forward. Since then, the G20 adopted that norm, and we've seen a decrease in that particular type of activity. But boy, there's a lot else going on, right? In the interim, we had North Korea attack Sony. 
We had war game for years. What would it look like if a nuclear armed nation attacked the United States through cyber means? And I can tell you we never thought it would be about a movie about a bunch of pot smokers. I don't know how many of you have seen the interview. The movie was based, not too many. I blame North Korea for having to see it over Christmas, along with the director of the FBI and the attorney general. But it's, uh, it's the only time in my career I've had to go brief the president of the United States in the situation room and start with a plot synopsis of a movie to explain why we were there. But, and this will be key for the topic uh, we turn to next, it was a sign of a different way of weaponizing information to cause harm. It's one of the reasons we took it seriously as a national security event. But it basically was a country overseas that didn't share our value of free speech, saying we don't like this type of content, we're gonna use a cyber attack to stop it. And what did they do that caused the harm to Sony? They did turn their computers into bricks, but that's not why anyone remembers the Sony attack. They also stole their intellectual property, uh, movies that hadn't been released. Again, not why people remember the attack. The third thing they did was weaponize information. They took embarrassing email traffic, used social media sites to distribute that traffic, and then watched as the mainstream media picked up on those sites, essentially doing their damage for them, helping with a, a, an attack against the Sony uh, Corporation. If that sounds familiar, it does seem a lot like the playbook that we saw Russia use to try to undermine confidence in our elections leading up to 2016. So when we're looking at these types of attacks, some of them are destructive, some of them are theft of information for the value of the information, but there's also this growing trend of weaponizing information and what, uh, what to do about it. So when it comes to that problem of what to do with the private sector, I think we're at the very beginning of the discussion and that's what we're gonna try to explore today in more detail. And with that, I wanna welcome our panelists uh, today who are experts in the field of disinformation and focus a little bit on what we might be facing prior to the elections coming up. To my left, I have Deep Hyam, who's a fellow at the Kennedy School, was a technical advisor to the Obama administration, and has been focusing on disinformation and what can be done about it when it comes to private platforms trying to counter it. Then left of Deep Hyam, we have uh, Renee, and Renee is also an expert on disinformation research and has been advising the Hill as they're trying to come up with congressional solutions. And to the, uh, to the far left, uh, Monica Bickert, who's a former uh, prosecutor from the Department of Justice and was brought on by uh, Facebook and has been handling the policies for Facebook on user-generated content to try to prevent threats like the exploitation of children, terrorism, and now moving into the latest threat of uh, Russian disinformation. So please join me and welcome the panelists. <laughs> and maybe we'll start with something I know that's been on a lot of people's minds. Um, we're heading into the election. We've already seen Russia effectively attack not just the United States, but Western allies throughout the world and try to undermine confidence in the integrity of elections and democracy. It seems only a matter of time before others try to copycat it. How are we doing? Are we safe heading into the 2016 election? Uh, well, first of all, uh, I just want to say thank you for having me here. Um, it's, uh, this is a tremendously difficult problem uh, to, to really assess and to, and to drive, uh, drive forward uh, in regard to public policy. Um, and I'm talking about the disinformation problem. And uh, we see all this news about different platforms and different incidents happening, and um, it's, it's very hard to analyze altogether in, in, in one go. Um, and what I, what I try to do is, is really uh, dissect this into two, two types of problems, um, both of which are complex, one of which I think is treatable with policy uh, in, the, in the near future. Um, the first is the problem of demand. There, there is always going to be uh, the, the nefarious actor who's trying to push disinformation into the political sphere and try to subvert uh, the American political process or, or whichever jurisdiction we, we are talking about. And that's a, that's a largely unsolvable problem, at least for now. Um, I think that the, the other problem is that of the infrastructure. It's the core infrastructure um, in our digital ecosystem that enables and abets the spread and proliferation of disinformation. 
Uh, and core to that, I think, uh, are, the, are the internet platforms, the, the leading internet platforms that uh, we all know and love. And um, what we've seen is that there's a, there's a tremendous alignment in the interests of internet platforms like uh, Twitter and Google and Facebook, where I used to work, uh, and uh, people who are trying to push uh, malicious content onto these networks, including disinformation as well as hate speech and other uh, malicious content. Um, and that alignment is really uh, driven by the fact that both the internet platform, whether it's whether it's YouTube's recommendation system or, or Facebook's news feed or the Twitter feed, both the platform and the disinformation operator, or more generally an advertiser, want to engage the user for as long as possible, for as many minutes as possible during the day. And to do that, they create behavioral profiles on individuals and try to target relevant content and advertisements uh, at those individuals to keep them scrolling in the news feed or clicking through to the next video. And until and unless we break that alignment and dissect that alignment, we're not going to be able to solve this problem. Um, and I think core to the issue here is the business model that's at play uh, at the core of the consumer internet today. Um, so if we look at any of these major companies, that business model is really premised on two things, uh, maybe three. First, the creation of tremendously compelling services like, like Messenger or the news feed or, or YouTube. Second, the collection, unchecked collection of behavioral data on the individual through that service to create behavioral profiles and tracking profiles about the individual so that relevant content can be targeted. And third, the creation and, and development over time of tremendously complex algorithms to curate content to the top of the news feed or to recommend the next video. Uh, and also to route advertisements, digital display ads. Uh, and it's that mix that, that is really driving this whole problem. And the lack of a solution to really suss out who are the, who are the bad players and who are the legitimate players in this ecosystem who are trying to push content uh, through these airwaves. Um, and I think looking at that business model, it's two things that, that really need to be treated. Uh, the uninhibited collection of behavioral data, and the creation of these tremendously opaque algorithms. Um, and how do we treat that? Uh, well, I think, I think Europe is, is partway there already um, in thinking about comprehensive privacy reform um, and, and actually enforcing it as of last month uh, through its general data protection regulation. But uh, I think in the U.S. we're starting to see movement as well. Um, whether we look at California or whether we look at the, the conversations that uh, California legislation is driving in, uh, at, at the national level, um, I think it's time to start thinking about uh, bringing privacy back to the individual and thinking also about what other protections consumers and individuals, voters need uh, in the face of the industry. Let me try to break, uh, break it up a little bit as we, as we turn to Renee into three different issues that we saw. We're focused for the moment on, on elections. One thing we saw Russia do was attack campaigns like the mm -hmm. Democratic Na uh, National Committee, steal data, yep. release that data that gets picked up through uh, non-traditional sites, but then gets picked up by mainstream sites and into, uh, and into the flow. Uh, and whether or not that's, we should be worried about that. Is that fair or unfair? That's not really um, a, a social media, that may help with the distribution, uh, but it's not a social media problem necessarily. Mm -hmm. Number two would be people using social media to pretend they're somebody else. Yep. Um, so that they're, they're putting co content out under false, uh, false premises, and there is a real person that they're uh, pret pretending to be. And number three would be, they're generating content, they're not impersonating anyone else, but it's content that is being sponsored or funded by a nation state. Yeah. I was hoping as, as you tackle this problem, how do we distinguish between those three and what, yeah. what's the role of the private sector when it comes to those three? So what you're describing first is called narrative laundering. That's the term we use for it. It's the idea that you have um, something that, you, you have a message that you want to get out and who you put that out as 
um, is, a, is, a, is something that we see, um, you spoke about ISIS, right? ISIS was really building a brand. They were establishing a virtual caliphate. Everything that they put out was easily attributed to ISIS. Russia chose to do something different. They chose to do it subversively. So they, the pages that they created looked like they were pages created by Americans. That's one reason why they were so difficult to detect. I think what might help to, to frame this a little bit is to, to talk about how we think about it uh, at, at New, Lo no, excuse me, New Knowledge, my company, um, because what, what I think we need to understand is, you, you asked the question, is, is the election safe? Uh, and, and my one word answer to that is no. And, then, and I think that we can extrapolate out past that, actually, to say that if you run a business, that is also not safe. Um, we see consistently four primary types of actors. We see state-level intelligence services, state-level actors. Uh, we see violent extremist groups and other extremist groups. We see domestic ideologues, which are very, very, very hard to deal with um, because they are not uh, enemies or foreigners and, and they just are leveraging the same exact tools and tactics that we see on social platforms. And the fourth would be the economically motivated folks, the spammers, the Macedonian um, news, uh, people who created fake news sites largely to commit ad fraud. So we have these four main types of actors. They're operating on the social ecosystem. They're operating throughout the entire social ecosystem. So saying Facebook didn't do this, and YouTube didn't do that, and Twitter didn't do this, really misses the, what I think is the key point, which is that no one is in charge of understanding the system as a whole. So you can't tackle a systemic operation with piecemeal solutions to individual things. And this is where what we're starting to see, the way that we're trying to make an impact, the way that we're trying to deal with these actors in a more holistic way is to recognize that oftentimes they're using the exact same tactics. There's, and that's because they're sort of a finite series of permutations of features and ways to game algorithms. So they're all kind of building off of the same playbook and this is why we have seen this evolution from um, conspiracy theorists pushing a narrative to the way ISIS pushed the narrative to the way Russia pushed the narrative. Tactically speaking, there wasn't a whole lot of variability there. So we believe that when we can monitor the system as a whole and understand the spread of information throughout the system, we can find opportunities to intercede. And that's where I see uh, the huge cybersecurity gap. We don't treat information operations as a cybersecurity problem right now in this country. We talk about it as if it's a narrative problem. We talk about it in the context of fake news and truth and that is just the, the fund, in my opinion, fundamentally the wrong way to be thinking about it uh, if we're, if we're going to push towards solutions. And Deepan talked about, uh, said essentially, uh, and I may uh, uh, mangle this, but that there are, there are economic incentives yep. that marry up the way social media companies are making money with the tactics that are being used to exploit them, and that fundamentally uh, at the core of that problem is privacy uh, and the regulation of the privacy of, of data. Do you agree when looking for a solution that that's where one should look? Um, no, I don't. I don't think privacy is the, is the be all and end all. I, I think that there's a lot of different ways that people are thinking about going about this. Privacy is simply not my preferred area. Um, I see it more as an issue of, uh, the, the way that I think it intersects with privacy is in order to, you have these platforms with massive standing audiences, right? Billions of, of, of monthly average users. Um, and what we see there is you have these standing audiences, we know quite a lot about people, and that means that we can target them effectively. So you can make the argument that the fundamental thing at the, at the root there is, is, is privacy. Um, I think that, the, that, that that also kind of touches on issues of ads and what we see and things like that. I think that manipulation is actually sort of a separate tangential um, problem that is related to the fact that we are targetable and we're well targetable, I, I don't necessarily believe that privacy is like the solution for the disinformation problem. Uh, and Monica, uh, I'm curious to hear your response as someone dealing with, uh, dealing with the platform day to day. Also, I tend to think of this a little bit in three waves uh, when it comes to the problems faced by platforms. When I was early prosecuting computer hacking cases, there was a major problem with child porn, child exploitation, not that there, there still is. But I remember MySpace, it was felt, didn't have an effective solution. It drove MySpace out of business. And some say that's kind of the genesis of where Facebook grew. And then the next wave was one uh, that was I in, which was confronting terrorists getting more sophisticated about exploiting social media. And now we have this third wave problem of uh, nation state exploitation. You've handled all three. I was wondering if you could walk, are there parallels or the things we can learn? I, I think there are, and I think a lot has to do with what 
Renee was setting up about what the gap is between um, having individual companies or individual countries working on solutions to these threats versus having one overarching uh, framework for thinking about these things. And just quickly to, it, to focus on what the economic incentives are, you just said it right there, John. Uh, MySpace and other companies have had challenges, other social media companies have had uh, challenges to their business because of bad content on their site, whether it's bullying or whether it's terror propaganda or whether it's child pornography. Uh, the long-term economic incentive of the companies is to make sure that the platforms are safe places. People aren't going to come to Facebook if it's not a safe place. It's that simple. So when we're thinking about what our incentives are and the reason my team exists, my team writes the rules for uh, safety on Facebook, a lot of that is hiring people who want to do the right thing. So if you look on, on my team, we have uh, people who were in government, people who are specialists in these safety issues and have spent their career studying these issues. They come to Facebook because they're passionate about this, and, and that matters a lot to me. But uh, we also know it is a business imperative to make sure that we are, are keeping the site safe. So this also uh, drives a lot of what we do in thinking about how we can use technology. Certainly, the, uh, the people on my team who've spent their careers working on countering terrorism or countering extremism, they're going to care about it. But a, a way that we also make it a priority for the company is showing that uh, our, our incentive is very much aligned with those who want to make sure that this is a safe place. Um, with child safety and with countering terrorism, what we saw was this sort of arc which will probably surprise nobody, but basically there's a problem. Um, this problem exists in the offline world. The problems we see in the offline world tend to come to the online world. These are powerful social media tools, are powerful amplification and connection tools. And so you see something like child exploitation, which I dealt with a lot when I was a prosecutor, come into the online space. And then you see individual companies recognizing that. You see individual governments recognizing that, but you don't really have a coherent yeah. strategy. Over time, what we saw with child safety was the industry coming together and forming um, a way to share technology. In fact, we hosted, this is still very much alive, and in April we hosted uh, our annual hackathon where engineers from all the companies come together and work on child safety solutions for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and, and others who are in the fight against child sexual exploitation. And then you start to see working relationships between governments and the private sector. With terrorism, we've seen the same thing. Really, I think, uh, and, and John, you were on the other end of this, but I would say with the rise of ISIS, and especially in 2015, we saw a lot of developments where suddenly industry started coming together quite a bit. And we had a working group of, of companies that were looking at how to fight terrorism online. Now, we have a formal group called the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism with more than 70 companies participating. And, uh, we train smaller companies all over the world. We have technical tools that we share to stop the upload of terror propaganda. We now have more than 88,000 uh, hashes, basically digital fingerprints of terror propaganda, so that we can help smaller companies stop the propaganda before it ever gets uploaded. And now we have uh, working relationships with governments where they're coming and presenting at the Global Forum to counter terrorism so that everybody can learn from the information that governments have that they can share. With cyber, um, there's a couple different things that, that we're thinking about. When we say cybersecurity, sometimes we mean things like attacks on infrastructure or hacking or mal sharing malware or phishing attempts. And sometimes we mean this, this little more, a little harder to define area of disinformation. Um, with the former, with the, the malware and the phishing, this is something that industry has worked on together a fair amount over the past years. Facebook hosts something called Threat Exchange which is um, basically a way for hundreds of companies, we have about 500 companies participating now, to share identifiers of people who are trying to attack infrastructures, bad actors who are, um, pose cyber threats to companies. But it hasn't really focused on disinformation. Um, now we're starting to see companies come together more in that space of sharing what can we do on disinformation. Uh, we all just signed, uh, 41 companies now, tech companies, have signed what we're calling the Cyber Tech Accord, where we are uh, pledging to work together and to share technical solutions on how we can defeat these threats. And we're also establishing uh, more open channels of communication with governments. And uh, I think uh, a recent example I would point to is what we're doing with the Belfer Center at Harvard, 
which is basically sponsoring and providing advice on um, a bipartisan effort to help US government officials understand cyber threats to, to campaigns and to the work that they're trying to do through government and help them protect themselves. So, Dibalan, uh, I'm hearing in terms of the solutions for this particular problem, that they revolve around sharing more information between companies, sharing information and receiving uh, information from the government, and figuring out ways to analyze large amounts of data or bulk data at once and figure out patterns. The privacy solutions that uh, you were mentioning in Europe make it harder to do all three. How do you square that circle? Is there, do you disagree that those are parts of the solution, or is there a way to do both? Well, I think that, uh, let me first say I, I, I appreciate all those comments. Um, I think that privacy is not, not the only thing uh, that's at play here. Privacy is, in my view, one of the core pillars to, to the long-term solution. But there, are, as, you, as you mentioned, and, and both of you mentioned, that there are a number of things that we, the, the broad stakeholder community, in, including industry and uh, government and civil society, need to do to, together um, to encourage more transparency uh, from the sector, to, um, uh, to, to encourage better uh, threat information sharing amongst the leading companies in the sector and, and the smaller players as well. Um, uh, to encourage better uh, uh, commitment to, to consumers as to, as to how their data is being used. I think that there, uh, there are a whole set of things that, that we need to consider in the, in the near term um, and in the longer term. Um, Give me two near term things that we need to do prior to the election. Well, I think in the near term, what, what, two, two things that we're thinking about very clearly are um, political ad transparency, which Facebook has already acted upon, um, and uh, better detection of, for example, disinformation operations, but also all sorts of malicious operations. Um, but just to defend the privacy point for just a second. Well, before you switch, let me ask oh, yeah. one. On the uh, ad transparency, is that something that you think can be done voluntarily? Um, or, or is there some new regulation or law that you're advocating? Well, I, I think that we do need a law at the federal level. Um, I think in, in this particular situation, uh, we, we had a federal bill, the Honest Ads Act, which was being pushed by Mark Warner, McCain, and Klobuchar for, uh, for many months. Um, and then only after, uh, th there wasn't really much support for it, um, to keep a long story short, uh, until the Cambridge Analytica incident happened. Um, and after that, I think everybody in the industry kind of flipped. Um, but if you look back at the types of statements and the types of advocacy that the industry was doing before, uh, I, think it was, I think it was very difficult to see that moving forward. And in fact, I think those particular senators were, and their staff were probably resigned to the fact that it was not gonna happen. And even now, I, I think that we're not, seeing, we're not necessarily seeing the industry come out and support that legislation. Instead, what they're saying is that they'll um, do the things that are in that legislation on a voluntary basis. Um, in other words, make sure there's no law in the books. Um, so I think, uh, I, I think that it's, it's hard to see all of industry coming together and, and, and doing something like that until and unless there's an enforcement. From, uh, of, of such a law. And I'm going to let you defend privacy, having just advocated that the solu uh, one key solution is to be less private about who's paying for ads. Well, <laughs> uh, if, if, we, if we extrapolate what's happened over the past two years into the future, especially as, as 2018 and 2020 come around, uh, we are seeing the, the growth and development of this field of computational propaganda. How does computational propaganda work? Well, there are nefarious disinformation operators out there uh, whether they're in Russia or, or wherever they might, they might be. And they're not pushing only disinformation. They, there are all sorts of um, malicious content that is shared on social media platforms all the time. And how do they, how do they target the people that they... Uh, how, stepping back a second, how do they assure the greatest impact from the dollars they spend to push content and advertisements over social media platforms? The way to do that is not to shower ads on everybody in America. The way to do that instead 
is to shower ads on the 1,000 people in this corner of Connecticut, or the 5,000 people in that corner of Texas, or the 10,000 people in this corner of Colorado, who you know based on their behavioral data are likeliest to react to content that you send to them that has to do with you know, the North Korean dictator saying something 10 minutes ago, or President Trump uh, making a decision an hour ago. As soon as those types of events happen in the real world, we're going to see disinformation operators who are gaining in sophistication every single day. Uh, in fact, Russia wasn't that sophisticated in their operations throughout the 2016 election. Moving forward with artificial intelligence driving the creation of behavioral profiles and the, the routing of content over these social media platforms, both with the help of the social media platforms and through um, proprietary algorithms owned by disinformation operators, uh, I think we're going to see a combination of behavioral data and opaque algorithms, again, really exacerbating the disinformation problem. How do we, how do we treat that? I think we need to protect the American voter from uh, unchecked collection of uh, his or her data. Um, there's no other way. And, and again, this is not uh, this is not a solution for the 2018 midterms. I don't think privacy is going to, I, I don't think, we, we wouldn't even be able to pass a law that would come into effect before the 2018 midterms or probably even the 2020 election. But I think this is the longer term. So we have one short term and one uh, long term uh, suggestion there. Do you, do you agree? Are there other, um, or is there another short term, long term? You could agree and add. Yeah, <laughs> another no, short -term, I, I agree long -term. with them. Yeah. I'd say short term would just be information sharing, right? I mean, we, we have a, if we look to the cybersecurity industry, we have the model of pen testing, for example, right? The idea that um, you can hire people to try to break your system and then you can use that information to create better defense. I think that that's something that needs to be um, more thoroughly investigated as a mechanism for looking at information operations. I think it's not done. I think that- um, Let me pause you one there, because we had the, is that something, how do, how do we accomplish that? Is that something, Statutory, regular, can you use um, the power of the pulpit? That's the kind of thing where I feel like you can, I don't know how you can mandate that in a, in a regulatory capacity. That just becomes like, it's a best practice at this point. Maybe you have what, an answer to that. I think what you can do is make sure the legislation is not getting in the way and impeding sharing, which it sometimes does. Yeah. So I think that there's, um, so, so there's that. I mean, there are so many different flavors of, of regulatory efforts that have kicked off in the last year. Um, I am not an antitrust expert, so I don't want to talk about it, but there's antitrust. There are other sessions to go to on that. Uh, there is also the notion that platforms are information fiduciaries and that they're, you know, if they do have this information as they do, um, they have to be prevailed upon to protect it in the way that we expect um, doctors and, and other people who have privileged information to take a higher standard of care uh, when thinking about things that they know about you. How do you respond to those who'd say that, why are we so focused on disinformation through social media platforms? People have been putting out disinformation for years. People have been trying to target audiences for years. Is that really what's unique right now? Or is it the, the criminal, criminal, actual criminal behavior and use of actual spies on our soil that was laid out in the Mueller indictment? Well, I think that the issue is um, you have a framework, right? You have a series of networks, they all, sorry, a series of social platforms. They all have particular features that make them useful to someone who wants to achieve something bad. Um, there is currently really no way to, short of third, third party um, companies beginning to look at this, to, to treat it almost as like a signals intelligence problem. Uh, there's currently just no way to detect that. So without the proper detection frameworks in place, I think that um, we're, in an, we're in an environment where it's, it's so hard to solve the systemic problem, I think is, is the best way to, to describe. I'm not sure if that totally answered your question there. <laughs> That's not, you're right, it's, it's not that the other problems aren't serious, it's that this is one where there's progress, to, it's newer and there's more progress to be made. There's sort of more immediate things that you can do. It's gonna take, probably years to get meaningful regulation through, but this is a industry managed solution that can have an impact um, in 2018, in six months. Mm -hmm. 
All right, Monica, how are you fixing this I, for our elections? <laughs> and, and just like with so many other types of, of abuse, uh, there's never going to be a moment where we're going to snap our fingers and say it's solved and we won't see this type of abuse anymore. All, crim all types of criminals find ways to uh, get around systems you have in place and they, they find new types of ways to achieve their bad intent. And with cyber, it's no different. We are, when we see a bad actor, whether it's in the terrorism space or in the cyberspace, we want to respond to that. But then we also want to figure out, okay, how could we have detected this sooner? And this is a lot of what you've seen. This is a lot of com the conversation at Facebook um, in the wake of the elections and the internet research, um, the IRA content coming from Russia. A lot of what Facebook <coughs> has been trying to do in the wake of that is not only how do we actually stop that from happening again, but how do we identify ways to get ahead of these problems in the future? So if I had to kind of focus on what the short term and longer term, term uh, I, I don't want to call them solutions, but uh, <laughs> measures that we measures. can take to get better. In the short term, it's focusing as a company on making sure that the behaviors we can spot, that we're stopping those. So with the Russian IRA, what did they do? They created content on Facebook that purported to be created by Americans and it was tied to a network of accounts. Um, they were linked basically to inauthentic accounts. Once we were able to identify those accounts, we could remove them. So there's either getting better at detecting the fake accounts, which we have done, and now um, we, in advance of the French election and um, the Alabama special election, we were able to much more quickly identify, in fact, uh, just today, we removed a, a number of accounts um, that are related to what we think might be bad actors uh, around the Mexican election. So if we see people who have fake accounts, whether or not they are trying to disrupt the election, and we're, and we're often not in a position to make that determination, we can at least say these are people who have inauthentic accounts and we can pull those accounts down. Um, the other thing we can do is make sure that we are putting more transparency into the process. Now you're right, there's a tension between privacy and transparency. What we have decided to do, and Facebook was one of the companies that was broadly supportive of um, the ideas in the Honest Ad Act from the beginning, is we have said, now if you're going to run a political ad in the United States, you're going to be able to see who paid for it. And you can see this now. You can go to the, I think it's facebook.com slash uh, political content ads, and you can see the ads that are being run on specific issues and who is paying for those ads. That's, I think, one step that we need to take. But in terms of how do we do this with legislation, we also have to be mindful that for smaller companies or for companies where the, the interface just looks a little different, their solutions on how they provide transparency might be a little different. Um, the longer term question is how do we make it easy for companies to share threat identifiers with one another and uh, make it easier for the government to share uh, important signals with the private sector so that we can detect things earlier. Great, and I think that uh, wraps up our time for this panel. I wanna uh, please join me in thanking the panelists. <laughs> and we're gonna uh, try to keep this, uh, keep this moving as we get them going. So I'm gonna start doing the introduction for our, our next uh, speaker. Our next speaker is as far as I know, the only chief uh, executive officer in our critical infrastructure who used to be a chief information officer. In other words, who has actual expertise at running the bits and bytes uh, of a company. So please uh, welcome our next uh, guest, which is the CEO of Southern, Tom Fanning. All right, thanks. <clears throat> So we spend a lot of time just talking about our electoral system and the way in which it can be manipulated. And when I was in uh, government, we put in a new executive order saying that we could take action if someone attacks our critical infrastructure. And we didn't define the electoral system as part of that critical infrastructure. It's been a change. Tom is at the heart of what at least we knew the problem was, which was that nation states, Russia, Iran, China, North, North Korea, Korea is attempting, are trying to attack our critical in, uh, infrastructure and is on the front lines of uh, trying to defend it. How are we doing? So you can't, you heard it before, you can't say unequivocally never, but you must understand my context is I'm not after punks, thugs, and criminals. 
What I am trying to prevent in America is the existential threat. That is, the nation states, or the, I call it specter. You, I, sure, yeah. you, what was your phrase? <laughs> Blended threat. Specter is much catchier. Yeah. It's the emergence of a set of people that use statecraft and collaborate on the dark web for criminal purposes largely. I call that specter, following the uh, James Bond movies. I'm trying to stop the existential threat. Somebody to create a bad day in America as a form of severe geopolitics, okay? I think that is extraordinarily hard to do right now, to execute successfully by the bad guys. I can't say unequivocally that we're not exposed. But the real issue for us is not so much the here and now, but what lies ahead in the next three to five years. Today, you deal with arguably the most underreported war in our history. Companies like mine, Southern Company, we're one of the largest electric utilities in America, get attacked millions of times a day. I have chaired the Atlanta Fed for three years. I chaired the conference of chairs at the big Fed with Janet Yellen and, and now Jay Powell many more millions of times a day. When you add up the aggregate, it is an enormous um, wave that is hitting the beach of bad guys trying to take us down. As we move from people to machines to machines to machines, millions becomes trillions. And your ability to defend now becomes a function of how good is your artificial intelligence. I love the movie The Matrix as they dump jujitsu into the brain of Neo and he becomes able to fight in microseconds. Our ability to withstand the attack, counterpunch ourselves, and learn the attack uh, surface and create our own defense on the move becomes a very kind of interesting dynamic in corporate America. Let me also set, what do we mean by critical at this point? Our definition. There are 16 segments of commerce in America as defined by Homeland Security, which is the cabinet level part of America, which has the responsibility for prevent and respond in the event of this kind of threat. Let's also not forget about DOD, which has the ability to fire back through US Cyber Command. But let's deal with this. Not all 16 segments are critical to America. I would argue this poor movie that you had to see, yeah. that's not critical. Electricity, finance, telecom are the three, arguably the three most important. There are others right alongside. I would say water, transportation, healthcare would be the next three. What we have done is pulled together a CEO-led effort to jointly protect and defend and respond to um, these kinds of threats. It's called the Strategic Infrastructure Coordinating Council, Electricity, Finance, Telecom. And in fact, we're rolling out, I will give great credit to this administration. The cabinet has now aligned along these uh, avenues to create a federal response to better protect and respond. And we're rolling out the first cyber summit, the first two hours of which, uh, January 31st, New York City, will be just these three sectors, just critical CEOs, and we've recruited CEOs for each of the segments. And then we'll open up the day to the rest of the segments. Let me finish with one other thing. When I say federal, and I say Department of Homeland Security as the primary response organism, all of the three-letter agencies are participating. NSA, FBI, DOD, DIA, all of those, and they are patriots. And there is an enormous data sharing problem among and between the three-letter agencies, all culminating in DHS and ultimately DOD to fire back. Then we have the private sector. In the critical infrastructure, 87% of that infrastructure is owned by private industry. Therefore, we must pitch, not catch. We must play offense, not defense, on all of these issues. And we are doing that. You will never hear that in any of the other kind of media 
that you were exposed to. People here have written books and they tell you all these dire problems and everything else. And it is darn serious. But I can tell you it is happening. You know, if you and I were going to get in a fist fight, the last thing I would want to do is say, John, in 10 minutes, I'm going to smack you right in the face. And if you throw a right cross to me, I'm going to throw a left, you know, jab or something like that. We have in-depth defense plans in place to deal with everything that we are facing that we know of right now. And just to give you an example, when the Ukraine electric system was taken over maliciously, we believe by Russia, the United States and my industry knew about that two years before, at least the capability. And we put in place defenses to do that. I cannot tell you that comprehensively we have all the answers to all the threats, but in fact, we are working in a terrific partnership between private industry and the public sector to make sure this stuff is happening as well as it can. Third, federal I described, private industry I described. Third is the boots on the ground, state and local governments. We've got to make sure that those are effective. We have two things that we're really working on now. Under the National Governors Association, we have plans in place to understand how the boots on the ground will respond to these threats. Further, Homeland Security is put in place in every state in some of the major cities and some of what they call Section 9 uh, entities, the super top secret, but very important to our critical infrastructure entities. We have something called fusion centers. We are now trying to knit together the information capability of the fusion centers with all of the capabilities of the states to help better respond. Federal, private industry, state and local. Fourth would be international. We are still finding our way on bilateral agreements to better protect this country from that existential threat. The, uh, there's a lot, uh, lot to think about or, or unpack, unpack there. Qu uh, question for you, we've talked about uh, and just to walk it through for the audience, there's this idea of an e ecosystem. If I want to protect the financial sector, the financial sector depends on the electrical grid in order to run its operations. If I want to protect the financial sector, it also to do banking these days, you need telecom, and I see why you pick those big three. What about information technology companies, or IT? Yeah, extraordinarily difficult. You remember the events of San Bernardino where there was a big controversy about being able to break into the Apple iPhone so that we could find out more about the perpetrator? There are a host of commercial issues that deal with the IT sector that cause them to be, shall I say, reluctant to be in the center of this public-private partnership. They have commercial interests. Apple needs to sell iPhones to China. What, does, what would China's reaction be if they knew that everything secret to the security features of an Apple iPhone was completely revealed to the United States government? And then there are very normal kind of public privacy issues that those people have to deal with. Now, I tend to take a very clear point of view. In areas of the existential threat, I vote for America. And I vote for complete, complete collaboration. But I also completely understand that that is not uniformly shared by a variety of people. And there's an enormous tension or debate now between kind of China rules or US Western rules when it comes to development of new technology, areas like 5G. It's the uh, you choose America approach. How are we doing on sh uh, getting the allies to share uh, a view around our values versus values that, are not, that do not revolve around a democratic uh, state. Yeah, you're almost in the uh, area of the Cold War. Even though we're in a shooting war right now, you just don't notice it or feel it, probably. We are in a shooting war right now. One of the reasons I want to have DOD right next to this effort is that as we get attacked, from time to time we get attacked all the time, I want DOD to have the ability to hold the perpetrators accountable and fire back. This crossfire you never hear about, and yet it is happening every day. The old dogma in the Cold War of mutually assured destruction 
is in some regards one of the ruling dogma that rules kind of how international conflict is being handled out. So instead of them trying to take us out, even though they try from time to time, you may have heard about Nuclear 17, where there was a clear attack on nuclear facilities here in America. We fought that off. These things are happening. And, and there are a variety of methods that we are using to either forestall or create opportunity to help America. I think the bigger issue lies not in the here and now, but what lies ahead. If you can create a better missile, if you can create a, a hypersonic interballistic missile, how Russia talked about that. Put the analog on that in the cyber world. Machine to machine, machine to machine with artificial intelligence. That is where the real dangerous landscape will occur. And that's what we're working very hard on. And let me push a little bit on the use the boxing, boxing analogy. One of the many reasons why I would not throw a punch at Mike Tyson is because I know what the result will be. That would be deterrence, right? You talked about millions of attacks a day. How are we doing on deterrence if we're not public about the actions we take in response? Uh, actually, deterrence is great. Uh, I, I do a funny uh, story, at least I think it's funny, <laughs> on three rules to winning a fist fight. And I'll, I'll go through it real quickly, but I'll get to the chase. <laughs> the first rule, almost everybody says, is swing first, which is the second rule. I could beat Mike Tyson in a fist fight. If I have to fight Mike Tyson, I know it's going to happen. Sun Tzu would say to win without fighting is best. I agree. But if the fight is already occurring and it's unavoidable, then I'm going to take kung fu, I'm going to lift weights, I'm going to take boxing lessons, whatever it is, and then I'm going to hit Mike Tyson just as they're wheeling him out of surgery. <laughs> the most important rule in winning a fist fight is to pick the time and the place, get ready. And that's where we are right now. It is the R&D of cyber warfare. One other point I want you to hear. In the existential realm, not somebody stealing your social security number, but trying to create a bad day in commerce in America, there will likely be intertwined a physical response. Physical and cyber together. You've got to think about it that way. Think about what Desert Storm was and how we took out the radar and all the sensing devices. Then we put in the kinetic devices, the bombs. Think about that in a cyber realm, OK? So what we would do is continue to work on R&D, prepare the beach, make sure that the bad guys are held accountable through the fireback capability and through mutually assured destruction, forestall mayhem. But we have got to skate to where the puck will be. And that's the important work going forward. The other, the other two rules. So pick the time and the place, get ready. Second rule is hit them first, make it count. Why will your first punch better be your best? Because you may never get another. Third rule is kick them while they're down. In business school, they say build a sustainable competitive advantage. I can tell you the capability exists today. If somebody tries to take us down, they will have a bad day. Hey, let me, we have a, a little more time, uh, time left, but what remains to be done? If there was one or two things to focus on over the next couple of years, what should they be? Yeah, so we continue the R&D and we got to collaborate between private industry and the federal government. Second thing is private industry collaborating. One of the things I'm very proud about that we will unveil likely at this cyber summit in July will be now finance, telecom, and electricity for the first time ever have a joined threat matrix, which analyzes all the different attack surfaces that there are, that we know of, and we, allow, we, we array those attack potentials by magnitude of impact and likelihood of impact. The other thing that we're working on for the first time ever is an integrated wish list, if you will, where we will ask the federal government for protections or for capabilities to better protect, better respond to these disasters. Better linkage with DOD and the fireback capability. The other thing that we need is information sharing. You've done a lot of work. I've, I have classified space that's pretty deep. One of the challenges we face in this space, and it's why you don't hear about this all the time, so much of this is happening in a classified environment. You will never know about it. Information sharing from a classified environment 
to an actionable environment in private industry is one of the big challenges we always face. Streamlining the transparency of information sharing is something we're always going to have to do and get better. Great. Thank you so, uh, so much for joining us today, and I'm glad our power will be on. Peace and right, care. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And now we have our, our final uh, panel. We're going to have Monica uh, joining, us, joining us again. She didn't get uh, enough of a beating in the first, uh, first round. And we have uh, joining us with as well Rana, who is a editor at the Financial Times and also a commentator on these issues for CNN. And Daphne, who is, a, uh, who is at Stanford University, and uh, Stanford University Law School, and used to be an executive at Google. So please uh, join me in welcoming them. All right, I have to go off topic for a second, because uh, Tom was, uh, gave such interesting, uh, interesting remarks. And we have uh, uh, someone who thinks he's thought a lot about information sharing and privacy issues, or two people uh, who have in particular. One of the issues he talked about was sh uh, sharing information uh, as I was hearing it, at bulk at, and with speed when it comes to certain critical infrastructure sectors. And I'm curious if you have a, a response to that. Good idea, bad idea? Does it give you pause? So I think it's, it's going to depend on the circumstances, right? But certain amounts of... What are you, of, at a law school? Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... A lot of lawyers up there. <laughs> d d data sharing in bulk for security purposes makes my Snowden sensors go off. You know, that, that, that shouldn't be the starting What are the Snowden sensors? Because Snowden still is, as far as I know, comfortably <laughs> ensconced in Putin's Russia. But did, was that the right focus on, uh, on the issue? So since then, rather than US government uh, abuses leading to problems mm -hmm. in an election, it seems like we had problems from Russia that, if anything, were hurt by the ability not to perform the analysis at speed to protect our systems. Did we focus on the wrong problem? I'm not sure we focused on the wrong problem, but, but I, I do think that sort of the, the big impact that Snowden had for American tech policy was the reaction in Europe. Like that was a moment of shift where you got a huge amount of new mistrust, a huge amount of new willingness mm. to regulate. Um, I, I think changes that we've seen in the GDPR, even the court ruling in the right to be forgotten, uh, threats to the basic ability of businesses to transfer data across borders, all of these things have been the, the fallout of the revelations and suspicions that came out of the Snowden revelations. I, I would jump in, actually, it's interesting, because <clears throat> I was in China when the whole Snowden stuff was going down, and I had an His first stop. What's that? His first stop. His first stop, Russia. yeah, exactly. And, um, and it was interesting, because I was meeting, at the time, I was over to look into a number of stories, one of which was the growing concern about US, you know, from US companies about um, intellectual property theft. And I spoke to a PLA general, a woman, interestingly, um, about this topic and you know, the sort of interplay between the public and private in China. And it was funny, because she said, well, there's no boundary between the public and the private in China. You know, of course we, we are doing tech transfer. Mm. Of course there is, there is you know, um, no boundary there. And, and it's just interesting, because it underscores, I think we are headed, and this complicates every issue that we've been talking about, we're headed into a kind of a, certainly a tripolar world when it, when it comes to the way in which data is going to be regulated, managed, um, uh, the way cybersecurity is going to be handled. The U.S. is going one direction. We're not quite sure what it is yet. We've touched on a lot of different bits of regulation, but a lot of things are up for grabs, both politically, economically, and from a kind of a um, cognitive, almost like FDA of tech type perspective. So that's one thing. Europe is going uh, a second way, and China has a third way. And all of that is going to increase the complexity of all the issues that we're talking about, I think. Do you agree, as a company that does business globally, that it feels like a tri tripolar world? Well, I would say, I mean, just to give some context for people in the room, on Facebook, we have more than 2 billion people regularly using Facebook, and more than 85% of them are outside the United States. So when we think about working with different legal systems, uh, different privacy regimes, different regulations on content, we have to be mindful that what we're doing for one country is going to look and feel very different. Uh, when viewed by another government. So uh, that's, just, that's a reality in which we have to operate. I'm curious, going back to the EU in particular, it, 
it seems in some ways that the, the EU focused more, its policies were America-centric in terms of the problems they were trying to solve. They revolved around American-based uh, companies rather than focusing on, would you put uh, China and Russia in the same poll, or where does Russia fit in your tri-poll? Well, it's interesting. I, you know, I think that there are certain rogue nations in this tripolar world, but, but I would say I would put Russia in a group of nations in which, um, you know, there, it's clear that there is a tech nationalism, uh, you know, in play. And that's actually a topic that's starting to pop up in the U.S. too. I mean, what, you know, one thing that I find really disturbing right now uh, in the conversation about regulation in the U.S., um, and I'm going to have to mention Facebook here. Um, a, a few months ago when Mark Zuckerberg was giving testimony on the Hill, um, a Bloomberg reporter came up and took a snapshot of his notes. And um, one of the things that came up was that if he was asked about whether or not there should be um, regulation or a breakup of some of the largest t tech platform firms, that he should mention that this would put the U.S. at a disadvantage to China. Because as you know, we've talked about, I think, touched on here, but also will be looked at more deeply in other sessions, um, the entire game right now is really who's going to win the, the high-tech industries of the future, U.S. or China. That's what the trade war is about. That's what, that's what uh, the economic game is about right now. And so there is this sort of sense that, well, the U.S. has to galvanize and, and we have to be big and we have to stay ahead of China because China has a uh, surveillance state and all the, all the data they can mine and um, tons of quantum computing power. But to me... That actually skews the issue. I think that we need to focus on the strengths of our system. The reason that companies like Facebook or Google or any number of other great startups were allowed to, to exist in this country is that we, we do have, we have had a decentralized system. And whenever there is too much concentrated power, um, we look for ways to, to regulate that and to even the playing field. And I think that, that that's a conversation we'd be having. So go, yeah, yeah. Go, going back to Europe, I think you know, right now there are two cases going to the Court of Justice of the European Union that both ask, can European courts order global compliance with their laws about speech and communication? And one is about Google and global enforcement of the right to be forgotten, and the other one is about Facebook and global enforcement of Austrian hate speech rules. And um, I, I think many Americans look at that and are like, why are they exporting their speech policy but the way Europeans look at it is America has been exporting the First Amendment for decades via the medium of, of technology companies like, like Google and, and like Facebook, and we don't like the results. Um, and, and so Could there's a lot of- Could you walk through a little bit just for the audience, the Aust Austrian hate crime law, uh, give them a little more detail? Uh, well, what is the difference between the two approaches of First Amendment versus the approach advocated in the case? Certainly, well, so in, in the US, Anything, almost anything you could characterize as hate speech cannot be prohibited by the government be, because our, our First Amendment is so strongly in the favor of you know, free discourse even if it is offensive. That is very much not the European approach. The European approach is you balance different rights, rights to dignity, rights to public order, um, it, resistance of the rise of you know, white nationalist groups, and, and so you, you strike some kind of compromise. And in this case, the translations of the particular terms were like uh, bumpkin you know, or treacherous oaf. You know, they, they were things that would not strike any American as, as hate speech or something something that you would call illegal. Um, but, but what um, sort of the, the trajectory that we see in Europe right now is pressure on companies not only to comply with European speech standards, which are different, but also to build in operational changes that will affect the whole world. And, and one is pressure to build filters, to build automated technology that's going to check and see what speech is illegal and make it disappear automatically so that you know, this, all these problems go away. Um, the problem with that, of course, is it's really hard to tell what speech is illegal. You know, we, we sort of start from the, the background, which I think Monica talked out, about a little bit, of child sex abuse imagery. Um, that is the easiest case scenario. That is material that is illegal in every single context. And so if you use a machine and you find a duplicate of it, you know it's illegal in this new context too. But if you shift and what you're talking about is potentially terrorist speech, that gets you into the zone 
of videos that are used by propagandists in one context, but used by news reporting or counter-radicalization efforts in others. Or more pointedly, and there was a Wired story about this this morning, you get filters taking down videos of violence that were uploaded by human rights organizations for the purposes of documenting war crimes in Syria or atrocities in Syria for future prosecution. Uh, so you, you get all of this collateral damage with other things coming down. Um, but the, the sort of the, the European pressure right now is you have to build these. You have to have a way to make terrorist content come down within one to two hours of when it's uploaded. Um, and, and so it, it's a push toward um, a system with, <laughs> with a lot of collateral damage for other speech. Let me hit, that's, that's really interesting, and you actually have to wrestle to apply these uh, yes. policies. But uh, I'm going to use part of Rhonda's frame, too, which is, okay, child exploitation and pornography, global consensus, even among rogue nation states, that that's bad. Terrorism, you don't have global consensus because you're going to have some rogue nation states that are sponsoring That's the right. terrorism that you're combating. And now you have the third hate level speech. problem, disinformation, yeah, disinformation possibly uh, to calling people treacherous oafs and other types of uh, hate speech, which I like as a, uh, a new phrase. But that, now you're a global company, but the nation states have uh, different views as mm. to, uh, there's no global consensus on what you should be doing. How do you, how do you act in those three different areas? That's, that's exactly right. The, so our policies are global, meaning if you're using Facebook in France or South Africa or India or the United States, the policies say you can't share terror propaganda, you can't threaten somebody, you can't bully somebody, and so forth. Um, beyond that, Governments will sometimes come to us and say, this may not violate your rules, but it's illegal in our country and we expect you to take it down. We do often, as, as I think John made the point, we do often uh, have other countries saying, or maybe Jeff made the point, you're exporting the First Amendment speech values to Europe. Actually, if you look at Facebook's content standards and the content standards of the other main social media platforms, when it comes to hate speech, they actually track much closer to the European model. We don't allow hate speech. But our definition of hate speech does not necessarily map to the German definition or the Indian definition. And so you find yourself in these situations where governments are saying, well, we expect you to implement our version of what is hate speech. The way that most of the companies deal with this and the way that Facebook deals with this is we'll look at their legal process, who's making the request, we'll look at their law, if it looks like the content is actually covered by the law and the law is consistent with uh, human rights, then we will remove that content in that country only. So in Germany, if there was something that was covered by their hate speech law and not covered by our hate speech standard, then we might make it unavailable to users in Germany. But everybody else can see it. And what we are now seeing is a potential push to say, no, you actually have to remove it everywhere. And if you think about the German hate speech law, maybe that doesn't bother you that much. But if you think about some of the other restrictions on speech that we see in countries uh, where there are restrictions against uh, anti-government speech or speech that they might deem blasphemy um, or against their country's heritage, then you get into to some pretty weird places pretty fast. So that's something that we're trying to tackle in some ways through transparency by publishing every six months a report where we say, mm -hmm. and you can go to, if you can just uh, Google Facebook government request report, and the other tech mm -hmm. companies put these out as so well, great. you'll see, you can actually click on a country and you can see this country requested that we remove this amount of illegal content and here's what it, here's the, the nature of that sort the, of content. These reports are great actually, and I look at them frequently, and in fact I was going to bring this up because um, even though, it, just to step back, I want to make two points. One is a little, a little point of history. I actually happen to be, I wrote a book about finance and the financialization of the economy, and now I'm writing a book about the rise of big tech and kind of what it means for the economy and, and our politics. And so I've been going back and looking at the history of the rise of the industry. And um, in, as I'm sure you know, in 1998, when um, Larry Page and Sergey Brin first did the paper about Google, sort of introducing search in the company, there is a, at the very end, and I would encourage you all to read this, there's an appendix 
that really kind of lays out where we are and says, look, it is possible that if you have a, this search technology that it can be abused by private companies, by public entities even, if you're using an ad-based business model. And in fact, they kind of put out there the idea that maybe we need a search engine in the public interest. Okay, so that's point number one. We shouldn't pretend that we didn't kind of know what the trajectory of this might be. That said, it is not easy to be a tech platform company today. And I think that these reports that you mentioned really illustrate that. A few weeks ago, I went and looked up the Google report. And in the last six months, um, reported six months, ending, I think, last July, um, there were 86,000 requests for user data from governments and, and entity, public entities all over the world. 60% of those resulted in some kind of information, user information being given to those, those entities. Now, some of that is just the company has no choice. It comes via subpoena. You have to turn it over. But in a lot of those cases, the com companies ha do have some right to or and or obligation, however you want to think of it, right, responsibility, to say, hmm, is that really legally, um, is there a legal reason for us to turn over that data? They now have entire arms that are looking at the, these requests all the time. To me, that makes me nervous because hmm. That allows for incredible fragmentation in how data is being handed over. I would not want to be one of the people making those decisions in those companies. I think it's really tough, and I think it goes to the point about transparency. I think it argues for a lot more algorithmic transparency. I think it argues for maybe something like a, a FICA score for individuals where you can really see how your data is being used, who's pulling it, why. And uh, just one, one question, Sharon, because you, you said in passing earlier that mm -hmm. maybe the company, the, one of the key problems is the companies are too big. When I hear about the global pressures mm. that the companies are operating under, isn't the scale somewhat what allows them to uh, push back against different government requests? And well, how do you balance those two it's, competing? It's a great question. And you know, it, it, in some ways, because I spent a long time looking at the financial industry and writing a book about the financial industry, I see a lot of similarities, actually. It's something I've begun kind of examining more closely. In some ways, um, and you will see banking regulators, some tech policy experts saying, platform companies are the new too big to fail institutions, right? They, they, they are sort of like financial institutions in the sense that they, they sit not in the middle of financial markets, but in the middle of communications and advertising markets. And that's an incredible opportunity, but it's also an incredible challenge. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, the events of the last couple of years have, have shown that in some cases these companies are too complex to manage. And I think that smart regulation is called for. We've touched on some of the kind of piecemeal efforts, the Honest Ads Act, um, uh, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act has been tweaked to um, you know, deal with things like sex trafficking. Um, I think that you should see more of that. I do think we need a smart conversation in this country um, about monopoly power. I think that when you have data as the new currency and you essentially have a business model that is based on barter, then you start to see the economic rules of gravity really changing. And I would go back, you know, I'd um, study Adam Smith, the father of modern capitalism, who said that you need three things for markets to function properly. You need um, equal access to information, you need transparency, and you need a shared moral framework. And I would argue that none of those things are functioning particularly well in data markets today. And John, can I so, add on to the, uh, one of the uh, effects of the scale of these companies? Um, it's, it is certainly still challenging and difficult for the large companies to deal with some of these abuse types, but it is in many ways harder for the smaller companies. So when you think about the demands that Daphne was mentioning earlier where uh, European governments are saying you must remove terror content within one to two hours, they want these companies to find it within one to two hours of upload. And some of these companies, I mean, you have a company like Facebook where we, we have engineers who are working on dedicated systems to try to find terror propaganda before anybody reports it to us. And now we're at the point where more than 99% of the content that we remove as being terror propaganda, we are flagging through our machines before anybody's flagging it for us. Then you look at a smaller company and uh, there's an example, a, a one-man operation run out of Poland where this guy built a platform. It's actually, people love it. It's, uh, people are, it's a way for people to share videos and imagery, but he's one guy. And he doesn't have the ability to build a system to detect bad content, let alone in all the different languages that you see um, it, it being shared in. So some of the regulations, and Facebook has supported uh, like the, the Section 230 tweak and the principles behind Honest Ads Act and so forth, but um, one of the reasons that they're 
that we have to be careful in the conversations about legislation is it, it may actually mm. have the effect of protecting the companies who are already fairly established and able to deal with some of these challenges, even though they're still challenging, um, better than the smaller can companies. I, can I ask a question to, to, to you all? I'm curious, actually, because the Europeans are trying to find a kind of a middle ground, I think, right now between the sort of laissez-faire U.S. approach and the, the surveillance state of China. And one of the ideas that's coming out of France, um, you know, how do you protect the rights of the citizen and the individual in all of this? And uh, one idea that's coming up is sort of public data banks in which the state would have some control and responsibility, um, e economic cost being uh, shared by the public sector in all of this, and companies would be able to dip in and get the data they need to, to run their businesses, to do AI, to run the Internet of Things. Is that a viable solution to That's you all commercially? I want to hear you respond because when I think I'm about the- I'm sorry to the, grab the uh, mic, oh, but no, I just no, know I'm like two topics. the perfect, yeah. but the, like the- I, 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 I often <laughs> moderate, so I'm like grabbing the mic. <laughs> no, I was actually to follow, I, when I think about the controversy over the bulk collection of anonymized landline telephone data, this was the so-called 215 program that led to a national outcry and legislation that prohibits now the collection of anonymized landline telephone data. How do you, what do you think of the government holding all the data solution? I'm going to break the rules and, and go back to the, to the previous top. question. You were trying to <laughs> go. It's a pivot. It's not breaking the rules. Yeah. That's just a pivot. So, so because I, I, I want to push back on the idea that having very large global platforms necessarily helps and protects users, because I think it also is a source of great vulnerability. Mm. If you think about a dissident Malaysian blogger, real world example, moves to London, starts a blog there critiquing the now ousted president for, for corruption. If, we, if it were 10 years ago, that blog would be hosted on a server in the UK and there's nothing the Malaysian government can do to get to it and, and stop this person or demand data about him. Hmm. Now, that blog was hosted on Medium. Medium took a stand. The Malaysian government came and said, you have to take this down. It's defaming our president. It's illegal in these 10, 10 ways. Medium took a stand and said, no, we're not going to silence this person. And the result is they got blocked in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. All Malaysian ISPs were instructed to block the platform. Um, but Medium's back end is on Amazon Web Services, mm -hmm. right? So there's yet another layer in the stack of an even bigger and more global company that probably does have offices in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. and, and so having all of our you know, online communication and privacy rights in, in the hands of multinational companies that are vulnerable to pressure everywhere um, I, I think is actually not an improvement in many ways. No, I do, I do think that's right. And just to, just to be clear, um, you know, as these companies get bigger, you do get more requests. And you can see this, look at any of the companies' government request reports, and you'll see that as they get bigger, the number yeah. of government requests goes up every year. They're just more visible in different areas around the world. But they're also um, holding more data, which yes. is another reason that the government's... That's right. Yeah. So in some ways, the challenges get bigger. But in other ways, like when we're talking to the Europeans about legislation, some of the things that they have in mind for us to build artificial intelligence to find, it would be a lot easier for the bigger companies to do. And for the smaller companies, it might actually prohibit them from growing. And, and you can I see that this point... is a conversation that could keep, uh, <laughs> oh, that could keep going. I want to uh, both thank our group and also call attention, because this is a conversation that needs to keep going, that the Aspen Institute has started a new program on cybersecurity and uh, technology. So we hope to both continue the conversation through that program and come up with concrete solutions. And hopefully we started, that, started down that path today, thanks to all of our panelists. So thank you.